Hi everyone, welcome to iWizard. So today I'm going to be doing a bit of a detour from fantasy, sci-fi, horror, and we're going to be talking about John Grisham's legal thriller, The Firm. Actually, uh, The Firm is very creepy, very scary. Um, so we're just gonna maybe slip it in there and hope that no one notices and call it horror. Um, so without further ado, roll the intro. <music> All right, Jordan here. So as always, let's start with some background here. The Firm was published in 1990. Uh, this is John Grisham's second published book, and it's really the one that put him on the map as a novelist, uh, and for good reason. This book is so much fun. It's a great thriller. Um, is it like Jane Austen or Henry James level prose? No. Is it completely free of plot holes? No. Uh, is the plot perfect? No. Is it kind of a beach read or a mass market airport book? Yes. Um, but this book is so much fun and really well paced and it's definitely worth your time. All right, so let's get into what this book is about, starting with a little synopsis that I put together for you. Uh, when Mitch McDear graduates from Harvard Law School, he is one of the most highly touted and sought after young tax lawyers in the country. He's been recruited by some of the most prestigious law firms in America, including big name firms on Wall Street, in Chicago, and elsewhere. Mitch and his beautiful wife, Abby, seriously consider the various offers he receives, but it isn't until Mitch takes an interview with a small, unassuming firm in Memphis called Bendini, Lambert & Locke, a firm that pays way more and offers better benefits and perks than any other, that Mitch knows he's finally found the firm of his dreams. Bendini, Lambert & Locke offer Mitch a huge salary, a new BMW paid for by the company, free vacations, and a low-interest mortgage on a house. They even pay his college debt. All of this is too generous for Mitch to resist. After signing with the firm, Mitch and Abby believe they are on their way. That is, until Mitch learns that Bendini, Lambert, and Locke is not at all what it seems. Mitch should have remembered what his older brother Ray, a prisoner in a Tennessee jail, already knew. You never get nothing for nothing. Now the FBI has the lowdown on Mitch's firm and needs his help. Mitch is caught between a rock and a hard place. Either way, he must make a choice if he wants to live. All right, so what I liked about this book, get ready because there is definitely a lot to like with this one. First of all, um, I wanna say that I love the way this book was paced. Uh, Grisham structures and kind of plots out this book for maximum suspense and tension. The story is set up so that you slowly learn more and more about this evil firm chapter by chapter. And one thing I really found gripping is that you get to go along for the ride with the main character as he gradually becomes more and more suspicious about the firm and like what's really going on behind closed doors. And I found that to be really sort of drippingly satisfying. He starts out completely wide-eyed and optimistic, our protagonist Mitch, especially because he grew up poor and had family problems and so this firm seems like the perfect place it's got great pay better pay actually than any other firm great perks just for working there mitch gets a huge signing bonus money to buy lawyer clothes free bar exam test prep um, a low interest mortgage a company bmw for his own personal use and the firm even tells him after he starts working there that they'll pay off his entire college debt then slowly slowly but surely he begins to learn more and more about the shadier aspects of the firm, how cutthroat his coworkers are, how intrusive the firm is when it comes to um, its lawyers' personal lives, just the sheer number of hours that you have to work there, um, the questionable business dealings, the weird tax stuff going on, the fact that women and minorities are pretty much never hired, um, the fact that so many people who have worked there have actually died in the past, and to top it all off, the fact that the FBI is watching the firm and Mitch realizes this. Another thing I enjoyed, um, I pretty much loved everything about the firm, uh, Bendini, Lambert, and Locke, 
um, how creepy it is, um, how it's basically a front business for the mob. I'm not really giving anything away here. That's the entire premise of the book is that the main character slowly realizes that he's working for um, a law firm that's really not a law firm. It's actually part of the Moralto family um, crime organization. The headquarters uh, uh, of the firm is in Memphis, Tennessee, and it's like this evil um, hold fast. In fact, they call it the fortress several times in the book. Um, I just love the way that the firm spies on its employees and secretly tracks their lives. The fifth floor of the fortress is like this secret locked area of the building that consists of a team of basically ex-cop private investigators that keep the firm out of trouble and spy on the lawyers and track the FBI's investigations of the firm. Just the criteria that the firm uses to select its new lawyers, how long this mob organization has been around, the ways in which they lay low in these really clever ways to stay out of trouble, the money and the perks that they offer their lawyers so that even when the lawyers find out what's going on, they never want to leave. Um, just the layers and layers of spying and security and corruption and the way that they set the lawyers up and trap them so that they can blackmail them um, in case they should defect. It's just such a fantastic plot. And in some ways, it's a very archetypal story, too. You have the sort of dark fortress that the main character needs to break into to get the files and all of this stuff. Um, so let's talk about the size of this book. This is a 527-page thriller novel. It's quite a beefy tome for a mass-market paperback thriller to be this long. is actually quite... Uh, unorthodox, but it really doesn't feel like it. Grisham uses the space to drag out the suspense to fully unravel his plot in this really satisfying way. At the end, the plot really tightens like a vice grip, and Mitch is stuck uh, between sort of two unchoosable options. And like the best kinds of stories, you find yourself wondering, will Mitch manage to get out? Will he manage to save the day and live happily ever after with his wife? Or will one of the various threats coming for his life get to him first? Um, and so all of that was done really well. Another thing, there's even a star-crossed lovers element in the book in the sense that um, Mitch's wife, Abby, um, her parents don't trust Mitch because of his class. They think he isn't good enough for their daughter. Um, and then there's the fact that Abby is in danger as long as he is working for the firm. So he never knows if or when the firm is gonna come for her, what's going to happen to her. So you're always worried about Abby. Another element I really liked um, was the FBI element. Um, I liked how the FBI uh, is bumbling and kind of incompetent and a little bit corrupt. They can't move in on the mob without Mitch's help and they keep making his job more and more difficult by basically getting in his way and uh, risking getting him caught. Um, I thought that Grisham truly got the FBI right in this story, which is rare. You see so many movies and you read so many novels in which the FBI is like this top secret organization filled with the world's most tight-lipped, competent people um, who are just paragons of moral virtue and patriotism. And I think we kind of know by now that the FBI, the CIA, DHS, these are pretty much just gangs with government badges. So that felt really accurate in this book as well. Um, another thing, I also enjoyed the relationship that Mitch has with his wife. Eventually, Mitch comes clean with his wife. He's been hiding it from her for so long, and he just tells her what he's going through and what he suspects, and they kind of team up to figure out how they're going to deal with the firm. And I'll say that what Mitch does ultimately decide to do is really cool and a bit unexpected. Um, I was not actually able to predict the ending of this book, which is always nice. Uh, so there are lots of little side twists and unexpected turns, um, and I found that satisfying as well. I enjoyed um, the scene at the Vietnam Memorial exhibit in D.C. Um, you know, in a lot of spy movies and legal thrillers and cop procedurals, there'll be this moment where the FBI is talking to the informant, walking through the mall um, on D.C. or walking through the Vietnam Memorial, and you had that in this book as well, but it was done really well. I liked 
um, all the stuff in the Caymans. Grisham uh, writes Tropical Paradise uh, really well. Um, and you can tell that he's um, been on Caribbean vacations and that part of the book was satisfying um, too. I think it's worth mentioning that this book um, also has that sort of theme that you see in a lot of other books of deciding to pursue the truth even if it hurts um, instead of living a life of corruption and lies, um, deciding to do what's right. Um, but at the same time, I like the fact that the main character, Mitch, um, wasn't some perfect Boy Scout. He doesn't just do the right thing because he's Gandhi and he just has some unimpeachable uh, moral character and he's just always doing the right thing. Um, Mitch is definitely not a perfect character. In fact, no spoilers here, but I will just say Mitch is out for his. Um, and I found that to be much more realistic than the white bread Boy Scout whose only dream in life is to bring down the bad guys and right all the wrongs in the world with no regret regard to his own reward or personal happiness. And again, I thought the ending was very satisfying, if a bit rushed. Um, all right, so that is all of the good stuff or most of the good stuff. Now let's get to what I didn't like. What I didn't like. So the writing in this book, um, the writing here was very simplistic, very average. Though, let me be clear, Grisham is a master storyteller um, and he's a wizard at kind of getting straight to the point and telling us exactly what we need to know and not um, dra dragging it out with long, boring exposition. To write a 527 page long novel that doesn't drag at all is quite an accomplishment. So bravo on that. The actual prose here was very average. Nothing special, nothing impressive, nothing dressed up. This is a mass market thriller novel. There's no attempts at stylistic experimentation, no attempt to deliver us um, penetrating psychological insights, no didactic moral message. It is just 527 pages of fun. That is all. And that is enough for me. Uh, what else was something that I could criticize? The main character, Mitch, is kind of a tool, um, kind of shallow, but somehow I still kind of liked him. I always found that I was rooting for him, and I never got bored of him. Um, he's smart, but he's, he's not an intellectual. Um, there's nothing really interesting about him except for his family background and his kind of will to succeed. Um, and also he has some attachments that, that were pretty, that were pretty, that, that I found to be charming. Um, there were a few holes in the plot, nothing major, like nothing that would ruin the plot or undermine the story as a whole, but there are definitely some things that I feel, Mr. Grisham, uh, you need to explain to your readers. There were one too many, I think, coincidences, some implausible uh, machinations and, and feats that the main character is somehow able to pull off. And I really can't say too much about them because I don't want to spoil anything here. But Mr. Grisham, did you know that there are such things as video cameras? Even in 1991, yes, Mr. Grisham, there are things that certain people could not have possibly gotten away with because they would have checked the video cameras. Uh, anyways, that's not really that big of a deal. But um, video cameras, there are video cameras. And lastly, the ending. The ending of this book was actually good. It was very satisfying, but it did feel a bit rushed. Uh, most things did connect for me, but it all happened so fast. It was kind of a blur, um, and I felt like it was kind of rushed. And I think uh, Mr. Grisham here could have probably added another 30 pages to the end, um, and I think it actually would have made the story better. All right, let's now get into my comprehensive rating of this book. Rating? Ranking? Um, let's get into my rating of this book. For story, this book gets a full 10 out of 10. Um, and I think I pretty much covered why that is an excellent plot well executed. All right, number two for characters, this book gets an eight out of 10. Nothing fancy, nothing special. We learn a lot about the characters, uh, but they're not especially deep or interesting. But they are likable, and you wind up caring about them a lot over the course of the story. They have their loves, their loyalties, 
They have their values and their breaking points. Um, they have their weak spots and their moments of judgments uh, and the trials that they have to overcome. And so that was pretty much well done. Okay, number three, um, again, when it comes to prose, nothing special. It was fine, just fine. Never bad, never distracting, but nothing that makes you go, ah, that's lovely. You know, there are certain writers where when you read a sentence, it's like taking a nice big sip of whiskey and you get that feeling in your chest. There's nothing like that here, but it's definitely fine, definitely serviceable prose. Number four, in terms of originality, this is a knock it out of the park home run for me. So good. Grisham basically gets credit uh, in my eyes for inventing the legal thriller genre and nobody, still nobody to this day does it better. Um, and this idea of his is just gold. It's the kind of idea idea for a plot um, that had he not even attempted to write this book and were I a movie executive and had he pitched this story to me, I probably would have written him a check immediately. Here is your check, Mr. Grisham. Um, actually, I wanted to take this opportunity to um, share with you how um, John Grisham came uh, to this idea, how he landed on this story idea. And I found this to be really interesting. So I will read this to you. Um, it's in the introduction. Uh, John Grisham says, somewhere in every novel I've written, there is an element of truth. What really happened might have been insignificant, or it may have been wildly dramatic, but it was there. And from it, I found inspiration. Those of you who have already read The Firm or seen the movie might be surprised to learn that I was not heavily recruited out of law school. In fact, I didn't even look for a job. I knew I wanted to return to my hometown, marry Renee, build a practice, start a family, and begin meddling in politics. However, one of my best friends was a top student, and during our final year of law school at Old Miss, he went on many recruiting trips to the big cities throughout the South and Texas. When he returned after long weekends, we would grill him about his visit. How big was the firm? What were the pay and perks? How did it compare with the others? Which had the coolest offices, the most powerful clients, hottest secretaries? Those of us not involved in the recruitment process lived vicariously through our friends' travels and fancy lunches, and he was a sport to share it all with us, not that he had the choice. After one visit to a weird firm he didn't really like, he made this statement. It was a small firm, very tight and clubbish, and I got the impression that no one ever leaves the firm. Sort of like the mafia. We had a good laugh, and I assume the other guys forgot all about it. I did not. For some reason, and writers can rarely remember why they remember certain details, the mafia-owned law firm laundering money in an out-of-the-way city stuck in my imagination. I wasn't thinking of writing back then, but I filed it away. When A Time to Kill was published in 1989, I watched sadly as it went unnoticed and disappeared. I was a busy lawyer and father, and I'd gotten myself elected, so life was hectic and I had little time to write. I vowed to do one more book, and only one, and if it didn't sell then, I would happily put aside my secret writing hobby and start suing even more people. I had bills to pay. Seven years after I finished law school, I decided it was time to create my fictional firm of Bendini, Lambert, and Locke, who had set up shop in an old renovated building on Front Street in Memphis. Renee loved the story from day one. I'd talked about it for years, and my agent in New York thought it had potential. I finished it in a hurry and sent it to him late in 1989. He was not too impressed and asked for another draft that included elements I had no interest in, so the manuscript gathered dust in his office. He wanted changes? I said no. Neither of us would blink. The biggest break of my career came in early 1990, when a bootleg copy of the manuscript surfaced in Hollywood. Several studios and production companies immediately expressed an interest, then others called. A bidding war erupted. I had no idea this was happening. When word finally reached Mississippi, I thanked everyone involved for finally including me. Then I sold the film rights to Paramount pictures. So that's a great story um, just about kind of a guy sticking to his guns um, in a very similar way that Mitch, the main character, has to stick to his guns in this book. Um, I always like to get a sense of how writers come up with their ideas. Uh, and um, I like the fact that 
um, this story was born from the stuff of life. Alrighty then, so lastly, let's get into the world building. World building here is a 10. Everything is so well explained. The details are satisfying. The world is so well realized. A lot of research clearly went into this book to make it feel layered, textured, and real. Um, definitely worked to suspend my disbelief. And so that was really well fleshed out. It's probably why the book was so long is because the world building is so good. And so overall, this book comes in at an 8.9 out of 10. An excellent, excellent second novel here from John Grisham. This is definitely one of my favorite uh, sort of easy palate cleanser, easy reads, airport books, beach reads, and I will probably end up reading it a couple more times before I shuffle off this mortal coil. Um, alrighty, so the last thing I wanted to do was to read you a little passage from Stephen King's memoir on writing. The reason I decided to pick this up uh, and read this book uh, is because when I was reading Stephen King's memoir of the craft, he talked about the firm and why it was so successful as a novel. Here is what Stephen King writes. I'm going to read this to you as well here uh, because I think he kind of hits the nail on the head here with what makes this book so good. Okay, so here's Stephen King on John Grisham's The Firm. What you need to remember is that there's a difference between lecturing about what you know and using it to enrich the story. The latter is good. The former is not. Consider John Grisham's breakout novel, The Firm. In this story, a young lawyer discovers that his first job, which seemed too good to be true, really is. He's working for the mafia. Suspenseful, involving, and paced at a breakneck speed, the firm sold roughly nine gazillion copies. What seemed to fascinate its audience was the moral dilemma in which the young lawyer finds himself. Working for the mob is bad, no argument there. But the frocking pay is great. You can drive a Beamer, and that's just for openers. Audiences also enjoyed the lawyer's resourceful efforts to extricate himself from the dilemma. It might not be the way most people would behave, and the deus ex machina clanks pretty steadily in the last 50 pages, but it's the way most of us would like to behave. And wouldn't we also like to have a deus ex machina in our lives? Although I don't know for sure, I'd bet my dog and lot that John Grisham never worked for the mob. All of that is total fabrication, and total fabrication is a fiction writer's purest delight. He was once a young lawyer, though, and he has clearly forgotten none of the struggle. Nor has he forgotten the location of various financial pitfalls and honey traps that make the field of corporate law so difficult. Using plain spun humor as a brilliant counterpoint and never substituting Kant for story, he sketches a world of Darwinian struggle where all the savages wear three-piece suits. And here's the good part. This is a world impossible not to believe. Grisham has been there, spied out the land and the enemy positions, and brought back a full report. He told the truth of what he knew, and for that, if nothing else, he deserves every buck the firm made. Critics who dismiss the firm and Grisham's later books as poorly written, and who profess themselves to be mystified by his success, are either missing the point because it's so big and obvious, or because they are being deliberately obtuse. Grisham's make-believe tale is solidly based in a reality he knows, has personally experienced, and which he wrote about with total, almost naive honesty. The result is a book which is cardboard characters or no, we could argue about that, both brave and uniquely satisfying. You as a beginning writer would do well not to imitate the lawyers in trouble genre Grisham seems to have created, but to emulate Grisham's openness and inability to do anything other than get right to the point. John Grisham, of course, knows lawyers. Okay, so I thought I'd close out with that little passage from Stephen King's book on writing about what makes this book so satisfying and fantastic. Uh, again, I'll probably read this again in the next couple of years. It is just such a great book, so much fun to read. Uh, it probably took me just a few days, four or five days, to read this you know, five and a half hundred page long book all right, so that is it for today's review. As always, thank you for tuning in and watching. Please hit the subscribe button below. Check in with me on Facebook, Patreon, and Goodreads, and happy reading. I will see you next time where I will be reviewing Frank Herbert's Dune.